So it's um, lethal and lethal peroxidase uh, antibody positive women with recurrent pregnancy loss, um, T4 life um, trial, which is a multi center randomized double blind placebo controlled phase three trial. Um, so I've got a few slides, um, a bit of background to the topic. So anti-TPO or anti-thyroglobin antibodies uh, are present in 2 to 17 percent of unselected pregnant women. Uh, in women with autoimmunity, um, hypothyroidism may occur uh, because of the stress of pregnancy and increased demand. TPO antibodies can cross placenta. At the time of delivery, cord blood TPO antibody levels strongly correlate with third trimester maternal TPO antibody concentration. Therefore, uh, American Thyroid Association recommends that all new thyroid women who are TPO antibody or thyroid global antibody positive should have um, measurement of their TSH uh, concentration at the time of pregnancy confirmation and every four weeks through mid-pregnancy. Ambri, can you just go back a slide? Can I just ask, so how does that compare to the autoantibody positivity in the normal um, non-pregnant population? It's about the same. It's about the same because I've written something about this in the past, as you might remember. So pregnancy shouldn't increase the antibodies. And then you talk about hypothyroidism may occur because of the stress of pregnancy. Can you explain that? So, so the eight, actually, you know, that I've taken some of these slides from the American Thyroid Association. So what um, they have said is um, just increased demand uh, in, in pregnancy. The paper in itself says that uh, pregnant in uh, the this TPO antibody positivity might mean that they have chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. And when they have actually increased demand in pregnancy, that can uh, unmask it um, and, and um, can go into subclinical or clinical hypothyroidism. Okay. It may be an unmasking of a predisposition. I don't know. Okay, Ro Roshan, yeah, exactly. I still know. Anyway, but yeah, okay, carry on. Thank you. But, but it might also be that recommendation 11 is incorrect. And yeah, so yeah. we'll have to come back to that. Um, so the question now is that, is there an association between thyroid antibodies and recurrent spontaneous pregnancy loss in new thyroid women? So there's recent ev evidence, I think it's from 2021, suggests that the prevalence of TPO positivity with recurrent pregnancy loss is about 15 to 17%. Whether uh, this associ association is actually causal, um, uh, there's conflicting data in the literature which supports both increased risk and no increased risk. Uh, of recurrent pregnancy loss in women with TPO antibodies and normal thyroid function tests. Now, these are all the references um, mentioned in American Thyroid Association um, 2017 guidelines. So these are some studies which support um, increased risk and some which supports no, uh, supports no increased risk of pregnancy loss in TPO antibodies in youth thyroid women. The, the ADA can, uh, we can Sorry, can I just make a very quick yes. point about all of those studies? It's that they actually, they, there are a lot of confounding factors for the ones that did demonstrate positivity, because actually a lot of those women had positive autoantibodies for lupus as well, which of course is a significant risk factor for a current miscarriage. So I think there's, uh, we have to take all of that with a pinch of salt, actually. Thank you. That's really Thank you. helpful. Thank you. Uh, so on the basis of actually these studies um, uh, and the evidence which was available, um, ATA recommendation was um, that there's insufficient evidence to determine whether thyroxine decreases pregnancy loss in this cohort of patients. However, if uh, there's history of recurrent pregnancy loss, um, thyroxine therapy, therapy can be um, uh, considered um, and they recommended a dose of 25 to 50 micrograms of thyroxine as a starting typical dose. Then another trial, which is worth mentioning here, is the 2019 TABLET trial, which was another double-blind uh, placebo-controlled uh, randomized trial, which recruited 952 women with a history of miscarriage or infertility. Um, they, uh, women were assigned to either uh, placebo or fixed dose of 50 microgram of levothyroxine group. Um, and the results of this trial uh, showed no difference in live birth rates or pregnancy in both groups. Although this trial has a large sample size, and good follow-up rate of uh, 98%, there were some limitations. The dose of levothyroxine was fixed at 50 microgram and it was not adjusted according to TSH concentration or body weight. The TPO antibody test was also not standardized. Uh, it ran on 22 different um, analyzers. Uh, the study was done um, in 49 centers across UK. And also the population of women's study was not uniform. They included women with infertility and miscarriages. Now, the current trial, T4LIFE trial, um, has uh, tried to look into um, 
uh, into the into the into the topic and taking into consideration some of the limitations of the previous study. So this is also a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which was done in 15 hospitals, 13 of them in Netherlands, one in Belgium, and one in Denmark. Uh, women who had two or more previous uh, pregnancy losses uh, before 20 weeks of gest gestation, who had TSH in the center's reference range and TPO antibody positive, were invited to um, take uh, part in the study. Women um, uh, aged 18 to 42 at the time of randomization were eligible. Previous pregnancy loss was defined as a positive pregnancy test and clinical signs of pregnancy loss, loss um, like vaginal bleeding or, or um, uh, abdominal pain. Um, uh, by chemical pregnancy um, positivity, the BDHCG was not required. Pregnancies achieved through both assisted reproductive techniques and spontaneous pregnancies were included. So in this study now, um, all women had antiphospholipid antibodies checked, and if they were positive, um, they were excluded. Um, also women with other autoimmune uh, diseases, thyroid disease, uh, who had previously enrolled in the same trial or had contraindication to liver carcinogen use were excluded. Women were randomly assigned in one-to-one -one ratio to receive placebo or levothyroxin. The randomization was done centrally with a web-based program and a unique code was given to each participant to ensure double blinding. So the study, um, to the participant study uh, group, including the nurses and doctors were all blinded to the intervention. Uh, all women received either a placebo once a day or a levothyroxine uh, once a day uh, dose. Uh, calculation of the, um, the levothyroxine dose was done on the basis of TSH. So if the TSH was less than one, 0 0.5 microgram per kg levothyroxine was given. If it, that's the pre-randomization TSH. If the TSH was between one to 2.5, 0 0.75 microgram per kg uh, body weight levothyroxine was given. If the TSH was more than 2.5, one microgram per kg body weight levothyroxine was given. The placebo or the levothyroxine was introduced before conception and con continued until the end of pregnancy in uh, the same dose. And so can I quickly ask, when um, at that stage, so those TSHs, because you said the inclusion criteria was less than 20 weeks gestation, am I right? What, so that TSH was checked at any time in the pregnancy, was it? And preconception as well? It wasn't that they varied it according to stage of pregnancy. Basically, at randomization, none of them are pregnant. They got pregnant uh, through the trial. Thank so you very much. There's preconception and um, TSH in normal healthy women who are trying to conceive. And I have in terms of giving pyroxene, did they actually give it, for, so if you were, say, seven kilos, did you get 35 micrograms, an odd amount to give? Did they, they, have they, they, they rounded it up to 12.5. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they rounded it up as well, okay. So um, all the women then uh, received strand standard obstetric care. Uh, TSH was uh, measured at three time points, preconceptionally in the first trimester before 12 weeks and the second trimester before 20 weeks. At any stage, if the TSH concentration was outside the reference range, the study was discontinued and the uh, participant was um, referred um, according to them and the, and the primary Ultrasound scan was done in, um, in the, uh, for calculation of the gestational age. Um, if the pregnancy uh, pregnancy was lost before the ultrasound. Last menstrual period was used to calculate the gestational age. For each participant, the trial finished after the end of first clinical pregnancy, uh, whether it was a live birth, uh, loss of pregnancy, or mono pregnancy, or two years after uh, study medicine was introduced without conception. So the primary outcomes were uh, live birth, uh, which is a birth of a living child after 20 week, week, weeks of gestation. Um, the predefined uh, secondary outcome was ongoing pregnancy at 12 weeks, pregnancy loss before 20 weeks, preterm delivery before 37 weeks, um, serious or, or uh, serious adverse events or adverse events, time to pregnancy and um, survival of uh, the neonate at 28 days. So um, the previous data suggest, had suggested that the live birth rate in TPO-positive women is 55%, and um, levothyroxine reduced uh, pregnancy loss by 52%. So the authors um, here hypothesized that the levothyroxine would increase the live birth rate by 20% by increasing the conception rate and decreasing the pregnancy loss. So to, to detect this 20% increase, uh, they, uh, they calculated the 90 women per group were needed, um, accounting for alpha error rate of 5% and beta error rate of 20%. 
And then the anticipated worst case fall, um, uh, loss to follow up of 10%, so a total of 100 participants in each group were needed. They also expected a drop out of 15% in placebo group because they were not receiving treatment and expected them to have subclinical or clinical hypothyroidism. So the final number needed was 120 per group. So the total end number was 240. They put more drop out of the placebo group. Uh, because of uh, if they um, had high TSH, they were not getting uh, high oxygen, uh, yeah. so they, they, they had to exclude they them. Yeah. Okay. So in total, 180, they managed to recruit 187 uh, uh, participants. Uh, of these, 94 were assigned to receive high 93 were assigned to receive placebo group. In total, of these 94, 69 completed the study, then of the 93, 64 completed the study. Uh, there were 20, uh, 25 in the liver thyroxine groups uh, stopped the study, uh, one developed subclinical hypothyroidism, three developed subclinical hyperthyroidism, five were lost to follow up in the liver thyroxine group. In the placebo group, eight developed uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, seven were lost to follow up. Uh, all of these participants who were initially enrolled to, uh, to the two groups were included in intention to treat analysis. They were included, excluded from per protocol analysis. So the participants were um, uh, similar in uh, terms of their baseline um, characteristics, sorry, uh, baseline characteristics um, in regards to age, BMI, and smoking status. Um, the TSH concentration for the levothyroxine group uh, mean was 2.1, in the placebo group was two. Uh, that's pre-randomization thyroid hormone concentration when they're not pregnant. Uh, also parity was uh, similar. So um, in levothyroxine group, 53 uh, women were only parents uh, and in placebo group, 56% um, uh, had no children. Uh, I did not understand actually these two uh, rows now. Uh, they're, they're, they're talking about previous miscarriages. Um, my understanding is that the, the, the inclusion criteria was that you needed to have two or more miscarriages uh, for all these women. Yes. So, so, so they're saying that both groups had an average of three miscarriages. Is that that right? A range two to seven or two to nine. There's, there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no mention actually uh, of this in the in in the article either. So I see. Don't understand. What, what do they mean by that? But even the nalipros. Nalipros was fine. So they had miscarriages, but they didn't have living children. Okay. But the miscarriages doesn't make sense because all of them needed to have miscarriages to be enrolled. Into so, the number, so they have three miscarriages, more than two. Okay, and then 2.8, what would... So the range is two to seven. So yeah. some women had two, some had three, some had four, and a small number had seven. The mm -hmm. average number was three. And then the next one, the 2.8. Oh, I see. 2.8 and 2.9. Good. Um, mm. Interesting, you're quite right, it's, it's a bit odd. Anyone know? Anyone got any thoughts about this? I think it's a bit bizarre to quote um, miscarriages as a kind of decimal point number because you do you know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll just carry on. Mm. Um, so uh, for the primary outcome uh, in the levothyroxine group, forty-seven women out of the ninety-four had live birth. Um, in the placebo group, 45 out of uh, the 93 had um, live births. Um, the risk ratio and adjusted risk ratio about 1.03, so no difference between the treatment and the placebo group. In regards to the secondary outcome, uh, out of the 94, 69 got pregnant in the levothyroxine group and 73 got pregnant in the placebo group. Uh, the pregnancy loss, um, so all, out of these 69, 16 um, lost their pregnancy at less than 20 weeks in the levothyroxine group and 24 in the uh, placebo group. Uh, all of the babies survived at um, uh, 28 days um, of uh, uh, neonatal life. So time to conception leading to live birth was similar in both groups, uh, uh, both groups. So at the from the time of randomization to conception, uh, median was 9.1 months in the levothyroxine group and 9.8 months in the placebo group. Uh, Number of adverse um, events were similar between the two groups. So um, seven in levothyroxine group and seven in placebo group. Um, two um, levothyroxine uh, pregnant women had ectopic, ectopic pregnancy, three in the placebo group. Uh, Hyperemesis, uh, very hyperstimulation and premature rupture of membrane occurred in the placebo group, but not in the uh, levothyroxine group. One patient had hemithyroidectomy, again, not uh, clear from the article, um, why did they need hemithyroidectomy? They have mentioned that uh, three having subclinical hyperthyroidism. 
Uh, numbers were also similar in regards to the method um, of conception in uh, women who got pregnant in both groups. Um, so natural conception, 50 in levothyroxine, 52 in placebo. Um, uh, ovulation induction was done in three in the levothyroxine group and four in the placebo group. Um, Intra-uterine uh, insemination, six and four, um, and IVF or FC was um, 10 in the levothyroxine group and 13 in the placebo group. So the two post hoc subgroup uh, analysis looked at the effect of preconception TSH uh, and a previous number of pregnancy losses on the live birth rate. So if the TSH was less than 2.5 or more than 2.5 um, at the time of randomization before the pregnancy occurred, whether it had any effect on live birth rate. And if uh, the women had two pregnancy losses or more than three pregnancy losses. So subgrouping these women according to the preconception TSH, a number of previous pregnancy losses again did not appear to affect the live birth rates. So the conclusion of the authors were that there's no significant difference in life birth rate after levothyroxine treatment in euthyroid women with recurrent pregnancy loss who are TPO positive as compared to placebo. There was no difference in any of the secondary outcomes either. So the main strength of this study is that um, uh, it uh, excluded antiphospholipid um, syndrome uh, in all the women in uh, levothyroxine and placebo group. Um, which would be a major risk factor for uh, recurrent early miscarriages. Um, also, the dose uh, of levothyroxine was adjusted according to the TSH and body weight. The major limitation is small sample size. They did not reach the number um, according to the initial power calculation, um, and the drop rate was high as well. Um, as um, for tablet trial, they also used um, different assays um, as the study ran in 15 different hospitals for TSH and um, TPO and body. Uh, assessment. Very nice. Thank you much. Any questions? That was a really lovely presentation. Thank you, Ambreen. I really enjoyed that. I think it'll be interesting to see because I, I don't know how much you know about what happened after tablet, but certainly tablet was very reassuring in demonstrating that actually levothyroxine supplementation didn't improve pregnancy outcomes for women who were TPO antibody positive. But I have to be honest, it doesn't seem to have changed fertility practice very much, certainly not within the private setting. I think it's translated a bit into the NHS now, but maybe with one other trial, like you say, which has got more strength than tablet in some ways, we might start to see that. But thank you for that. I think it's quite important that, uh, that this is pushed really, because I thought tablet made a difference, and you're quite right. People have carried on making EPO and uh, in the private sector and IVF clinics, they kind of feel we must do something. I mean, all babies are valuable, you know, but at this point, like more valuable. But the fact to make the difference is so nicely chosen, such a significant study, as was a tablet, really. Um, uh, one thing um, uh, in the in the first recommendation eleven of ATA it says that um, yes, you need to go back to eleven. Can yeah. you start that? That was an amazing slide. I thought because it's wrong. What do you what do you think, uh, Roshan? Is that not a wrong recommendation? <laughs> I didn't realize. So I've been through the ATA guidelines a couple of times. I don't know how many people have looked at it. It's like 600 pages long. But every time yeah. I get a talk ready on this, I go through it. And I hadn't realized they said this. So this is really well picked up on Ambreen because it is completely wrong. And actually, this you're, you're adding to women's anxiety, I think, by checking them this regularly throughout their pregnancy as well. Um, I'm not really sure where they've got this from and why they're including thyroglobulin antibodies in this recommendation as well i just don't understand Roshan, a strong recommendation high quality evidence that sounds I, crazy i'm not sure if anyone can exactly. hear me yes we can Becca, we can oh, yeah um so i arranged to talk where the the authors came and spoke about it and um in a slightly unsurprising turn of events, that they are very American and it suits their private practice. And, and so we, we had an interesting debate at the end of it, but it is very much like the, the strong recommendation, high quality evidence is neither of the above. Yes. So, so hang on, do they really know that they're cheating the public? I mean, is that really their aim to make money? I, I, think, if, uh, I think if you're in a different uh, healthcare, Setting it sometimes is. I mean, I wouldn't want to be that skeptical, but yeah, that's very, that's very, that scares me. I have to say. Uh, can I just ask, whilst we've got Rose Shan and, and, and Becca on the line, what's the latest on uh, optimal TSH going into conception, preconception? Okay. 
Yeah, I think, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm comfortable if people have one in the normal reference range. I, I have to say, I think because the evidence is quite grey for the subclinical hypothyroid group, especially when they have risk factors, I do tend to supplement them, to be completely honest. But I think it, it's, I think the key thing is addressing it before they're pregnant, because by the time they're pregnant, we're seeing that actually giving them thyroxine, it's a bit too late for them. And I would argue that we shouldn't be checking thyroid levels at all in anyone who's pregnant, that that's the, that's the sort of the worrying part when we do that without any clear indication. But preconception, if they have risk factors and they're in the subclinical hypothyroid group, then yes, I do supplement them then. Yeah, I, t I tend to target a TSH. Of, if someone's on a thyroxine, I go for less for about sort of 2.5, mainly because the first trimester you're exhausted. So quite right. frankly, I think it's more kindness than anything. But I think that- That's what I do as well, Becca. Yeah. As long as they're in the normal range, I think you can then reassure them that you're not causing any harm. And I think that, that that's the distinction is that there's a belief that if you've got a TSH that's three, that you're suddenly going to have a, a child that's, you know, a moron. And that's, I don't think there's any evidence for that. But if they're on thyroxine, then I'll, I'm quite happy for them to have a TSH in the lower half of the reference range to make them feel better. Well, I think Alex, you're on mute, sorry. If, the, if they're not on anything and their TSH is four and they're trying for a baby? I wouldn't, personally. Okay. I wouldn't either unless they have autoimmune risk factors, I think. If they have type 1 diabetes or something like that, then I'll be a bit more careful or I'll track it for them. But I think I, I agree with Becca. I tend not to supplement when they're borderline like that. But anything clearly above four, then, then I will give it to them. Also, I have seen a, at least a couple of women who have genuinely, even with... The kind of the what we've assumed we sort of homeopathic 25 microgram uh, that have been started because someone's picked up they've got a TSH of 4.2 and they're a bit worried have been really symptomatic and they felt really awful so I think you have to sort of yeah again it's a cause no harm thing uh, I think for the woman as well as for this potential. Uh, I think exhaustion <laughs> and treatment there's a big placebo effect possibly there not that I'm against placebo effects but <laughs> Yeah, Karina, I completely agree. And I think the other challenge is, is that when we get these women coming to the antenatal clinics and they've been put on homeopathic doses of thyroxine, they've often, it, it becomes a bit of an emotional crutch for them, if that makes sense. You know, they've conceived when they were started on it. And so trying to tease out whether or not they need to continue it can be quite difficult. So I completely agree there's this placebo effect and then they start strongly believing that they're pregnant because they started taking it. Yeah. I'm not saying to stop it because that will scare them. No, I, yeah, absolutely. And actually, I, I think that there's, you know, everyone does this slightly differently, but I completely agree. I don't tend to stop it when they become pregnant. I tend to stop it after the pregnancy. And I have been surprised a couple of times when actually at six, six weeks postpartum, I've had about three or four women have TSHs of 60, 70. So I was very relieved that I didn't put that through them yeah. through that when they were pregnant so no I completely agree I think if they come to our clinic unless we're absolutely clear that we know they were euthyroid before and it was just something that started was started by fertility services I don't tend to stop either yeah thank you so can I just have a TPO antibodies you know I'm really against measuring them in all comers so about 20 years ago I wrote an abstract uh, saying TPO antibodies are a waste of time. This is not in pregnant women, this is in, in all comers, because if it's positive, we check it again, TSA, and negative, we check it again. So it made no difference to the outcome of what we did. And I wrote this abstract, and I got completely hammered when this pregnancy story came about, and the TPO antibodies seem to be associated with bad outcomes, and that you could then replace them. So I then went quiet, but it's all coming back. So the, I, think the, I think the story that TPO should be abolished is correct. I mean, what do you think? Do you think we yeah. remove the access so no one can do it? Will there be any harm? I, I don't, I, I mean, I personally don't think so. I think it's, I don't, I think it causes more harm than it's worth for women planning pregnancy, to be honest with you. And it's quite, in, in some ways, I think these two, well, the previous trial tablet, I think it's raised awareness with the fertility specialists at the trust. And they now send me women to, to sort of have a chat with about whether or not they need supplementation. And it's been quite interesting because I think women get so fixated on the fact their result is positive and they really want to do something about it. And there's nothing we can do about it. And I think you're right. If we can get rid of the assay, 
I wonder if then we're getting rid of something. Do you see what I mean? That potentially yeah. causes more harm than good. I agree. And we get lots, I get lots of GPs who have checked it again in a sort of... You got very faint, Rebecca. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'll yell louder. I, I get lots of um, GP referrals who have incidentally checked a TPO antibody that's positive and they've got someone that wants to conceive and wants to know, you know, what do they need to do? Um, so, yeah, I agree. I quite yeah. happily get rid of it. So, so can I say we get referrals from people, from men and women who are not even thinking about pregnancy, who's only advised to TPO and body positivity. Mm -hmm. And on advice and guidance, when you say they don't need to be seen, they get very uppity. I don't know if you know that on advice and guidance. Yeah, if you're on advice and guidance saying this patient does not need an appointment and you save it, the patient gets that letter and can see that the evil consultant has denied them their own appointment and they go to pals immediately. <laughs> That's happened to me. So uh, it's a bit tricky. It so is a bit tricky. Any, any reason why we should not abolish the TPO antibody? No, or at least could we make it, I mean, if, the, if, the, if there's any good reason, could it not be like the TSH set antibody where you can only get it if you're seen in secondary care? I mean, I can't think of a good reason for having it at all, but I'm just thinking if, you know, if there, mm. the, the, as an alternative. Okay, I'm gonna, I want to start again with my crusade against TPO antibodies. <laughs> this that was really good. And it's so nice to see a nice negative study that uh, is published in a high impact journal. This Ant tablet was got into news, so that was really nice. We'll see. And really well for thanks for doing that. I think this is really important.